Hi everyone. So today's part two of our three lecture series. First one that we covered uh, previously was uh, spousal consent when listing a property. Today's session concerns multiple representation. And then the last one which will follow this video will concern informed consent when dealing with clients, customers, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So given that our office has literally facilitated the closing of thousands of transactions to date, we have encountered our handful of very funny situations um, which have resulted from parties acting in multiple representation capacity. So first and foremost, what is multiple representation? Multiple representation occurs when you have one brokerage representing multiple parties in the same transaction. So more often than not, this will be a situation where you've got, for example, ABC Realty that represents the buyer. They have signed a buyer representation agreement and a seller who has signed a listing agreement. Both parties are represented by the company and that's key because client and customer are not synonymous. A client is a very different relationship than one that flows from a customer service agreement. So that's the most common type of multiple representation we see. There are other situations where you've got branch offices. You've got ABC Realty that has a South End office and a North End office. Again, in this situation, you've got one brokerage, one broker of record, which means even though two different salespeople are acting on behalf of the parent company, it's still multiple representation. Now, the third one, which isn't very common and most people don't even know about, is where you've got ABC Realty, XYZ Realty, two separate companies. So if there's a buyer here and a seller here that are represented, ordinarily this would be cooperating, arm's length transaction, no conflict of interest. Simultaneously or subsequently, you have another buyer at ABC who also wants to make an offer on the property listed with XYZ. In this situation, ABC is actually acting in multiple representation capacity because they are representing multiple buyers in the same transaction. And so again, multiple representation is when you've got multiple parties being represented by the same company. Now, why is it an issue? Ordinarily, the gold standard is to have brokerages cooperate. You've got two different brokerages, two different sales representatives or brokers working for those companies, and each one of those companies represents the best interest of their clients. When it comes to multiple representation, this is a conflict of interest. One brokerage representing a buyer and seller in the same transaction, naturally, if you think about it, buyer wants to get the property for free if they can, and they want to make sure the appliances, chattels, fixtures, or every, and everything else in the property is in good working order for as long as they can get it to be in good working order. Whereas the seller wants maximum property sale price, and they don't want to be on the hook for anything. So the transaction by its very nature is adversarial. And for one broker to try to balance the interests of a buyer and a seller, or one brokerage rather, even with two different registrants, it becomes very interesting. And so this is where we're seeing conversations being had with Rico now about manda uh, uh, mandated uh, multiple representation and designation, which is a topic that we will discuss at a later time. Currently, I want to discuss how you deal with the situation. So the gold standard, as far as I'm concerned, is if you're encountering a situation where you represent multiple parties in the same transaction, ideally you refer one out, take a referral fee so that it becomes a, a conflict. Of, the conflict, conflict of interest is minimized. You refer them to another brokerage, you take your referral fee, and at the end of the day, it's cooperating because you represent the party that remains with you, whereas the other brokerage represents the other party uh, in the same transaction. So that's the gold standard. Now, some agents will say, well, if this transaction doesn't go through, if this transaction doesn't actually end up resulting in a, a agreement of purchase and sale, which is entered into, well, I've just referred my buyer on and that's the end of it. I've lost them. So in this situation, the next best thing, again, it's not ideal, but it is possible to do it is to have the party enter into a buyer customer service agreement. Now, it's very clear that in this contract, the relationship that's creating is one that's very limited. The buyer is not represented by the company, but we've also seen issues with this sort of relationship because parties, i.e. buyers who are upset with the transaction or something has gone wrong, will then turn around and say, I thought I was represented. I thought the agent had the best interest, uh, my best interest at heart. And then the agent pulls out this document and says, well, no, I explained to Mr. and Mrs. Buyer that we don't represent them, so on and so forth. So <clears throat> as an agent, to make this contract more enforceable, my recommendation is you have the buyer's initial in very specific parts. You can see that there are prescribed initials for all the brokerages as well as the uh, buyers involved. Using a red stamp like this one, have the buyer's initial right next to the words here that say, for use when the buyer is not represented by the broker. Similarly, when it comes to the working with a realtor, have the customer initial right next to the word customer, followed by another initial right where it says buyer, not represented by the brokerage. 
doing this helps you substantiate that you had the relevant conversations with the client. Now, sometimes you get really crazy situations where the broker's still uncomfortable even after explaining all of these things. And so brokers will go as far as recording conversations. My recommendation is that if you're overly concerned with the relationship, take the buyer customer service agreement, add in a schedule, just like you can with any other contract. So in this provision, it's schedule, uh, it's provision 11, where you can add in a schedule A, for example, add the schedule A, write A here, okay? And what I'll encourage agents to do is have the buyer very clearly write into this section in red pen in their own hand that I acknowledge that I'm not being represented by the company, the service being provided to me is very limited, have them initial right next to it. Anything that you think is onerous or something that could be contentious or challenged after the fact, get the client to write it in, in red pen, in their own head, and have them initial off on it. This shows a judge or somebody reviewing the file that you had those pertinent conversations with the individual, and more importantly, that they did know, in fact, what they were doing. Now, if customer service doesn't work out, you don't want to refer the client, and you're adamant on acting in multiple representation capacity, in that situation, you've got to be very careful with the paperwork. So, this is your co-op agreement, confirmation of cooperation and representation. In this agreement, there's a section for multiple representation. Have both the buyers initial off on this, okay? You want to explain to them. I've actually had brokers who will print this document out, highlight it, or they will change the color of the font to red and have the clients both initial next to multiple representation so that the broker is able to prove later that they had informed consent, they knew what they were doing, and more importantly, that those specific provisions were brought to their attention as evidenced by the initial, uh, the extra initial. On page two of this document, you've got consent for multiple representation. You want to make sure this is initialed off on. And again, when it comes to these relationships, if you want or if you feel that there's a necessary, um, if you feel that it's required that you further reiterate some of the provisions, get them added on into a schedule, have them acknowledged in writing, put it in an email, make sure there's an adequate, adequate paper trail so that if something does go wrong, and more often than not it will, especially when you're dealing with multiple representation capacity, you have the paperwork in place to be able to substantiate your provisions and prove in fact that you did go through the documents with the individuals and that when they signed them, they knew full well what they were signing off on. So these are the different things you can do. Again, gold standard, refer the individual out and have another broker deal with them, take the referral fee. It's not worth losing your license or being involved in some serious allegations where buyer is now saying, I had another agent. I already had a BRA signed with another company. So and so forced me to sign in this, uh, enter into another BRA with them. I didn't know that I was acting in multiple representation capacity. I didn't know <clears throat> that the company's loyalty was both to the buyer and seller. So gold standard referred them out. Second best thing, take them on as a customer, okay? Uh, and so that is, a, reiterate, first thing is to refer them out. Second best thing is to take them on as a customer. Lastly, if they're adamant on acting in that uh, transaction, in that relationship, execute the documents correctly, make sure there's informed consent so that if things go wrong, the parties know what are the boundaries are. You know where you've drawn the line, you explain very clearly, we won't discuss price, we won't discuss motivation, we can't disclose confidential information unless we've got consent to do so in writing. And again, you encourage the parties to seek independent legal representation if required. I've seen some agents go as far as put in actual lawyer's approval clauses in both the agreements <clears throat> so that when the buyer or seller does come back and if something does happen, they're able to rely on these provisions to say, look, we, we structured the deal a certain way. You had your opportunity to consult another attorney or to take the file and have it vetted by somebody else. You did all of those things. And after understanding all of these implications, signing off on and initialing all of these different things that we had you initial off on, you came back and said, we wanted to proceed notwithstanding the fact that there was a potential for conflict, which in this case there would be. I hope this video helps. We'll see you on the last one concerning informed consent.